Do we have any uh, bell ringers today? Anybody got a testimony? And then somebody can grab, uh, give this to Millie, please. No, that's for Millie. Um, a few years, a few years, a few months, a uh, few months, oh my goodness. <laughs> I mean a few weeks. <laughs> Sorry, it's like saying brother Becca Robin, you know, and neither one of them are raising their hand and they know who I mean. You know who I mean. You know, they give you that look where you want to go in anyway. So anyway, a few weeks ago, I got a call asking me questions about pension for one of my friends at OTS. And uh, we worked together as bus drivers and then worked together as business agent at the Teamsters Union. And then he went on the dark side. Well, that means he became management and I still stayed with the union. And I got a call about the pension and I asked, well, what's going on? And they said that um, it wasn't good for him. He probably only had a couple of days to live. Um, and so they wanted to hurry up and retire him because the benefit post-retirement is greater than the benefit pre-retirement for his um, children, who he had. And so I immediately went into prayer because this friend of mine I knew wasn't saved and I hadn't had a chance, even though I shared the Lord over the years, I didn't really specifically share the plan of salvation for him. So I immediately went into, the family was not accepting any visitors. He was in ICU at the time at Queens. So I immediately went into prayer and um, about a week later, I got a text from one of my other friends asking if I had heard what happened with TK. And I said, well, God must be answering our prayers. I haven't gotten anything that he died, so he's still alive. And then that week, uh, about two weeks ago, I had a, a doctor appointment at Queens. And so I asked Berta if she could go with me. We, I wanted to check to see if TK was still in the hospital and the family would let me visit. And I called and he was actually in a room. So when we went up to that room, it's like he's sitting over there you know, like somebody not at death's door. But, I mean, he wasn't completely healthy looking, but he wasn't at death's door like the news I got before that. And I told him, my God, TK, you're a sight for sore eyes. You know, he said, oh, Millie, it was kind of close. So I sat, I, you know, I talked with him, and I went through the Romans Road. And the Romans Road is in, in the book of Romans, you know, there's scriptures all the way that take you all the way to Jesus. You know, I mean, you know, you're a sinner, you know, all of this. So I went through the Romans Road, and at the end of it, I prayed with him, and he prayed the sinner's prayer with me. Amen. And uh, that's only, that's all God, because I mean, just a few weeks before that, he was supposed to be dead in two days. And so the next day, I asked him, I said, I'll come back tomorrow. Tomorrow, I had lunch with the, the old timers from OTS. I said, I'll come back. What do you want to eat? He said, an acai bowl. So we stopped at Logos and got him a new believer's Bible and dropped off his acai bowl. And at that time, he was waiting because what happened was, the reason he was in the hospital, he, he had, in 2013, he was diagnosed with the same cancer I had, thyroid cancer. The difference in that, and God is so great, because uh, Tiki is only 55 years old right now, and I'm 69. But the difference in that is God healed my cancer. Tiki's cancer went to his lungs and eventually to his bones. And that cancer has, has ravaged his body and made his heart very weak. So um, what happened was his lungs filled up with water, and that's what ended him in ICU. And they didn't expect him to live beyond two days. But God, you know, God is a giver and taker Amen. of life. And it wasn't TK's time. And I told TK that. I said, it's not your time. God has better plans for you. Then, I, then he was in um, rehab, rehabbing to strengthen himself to go home because he lives at home alone. Um, and, and what happened was um, his other lung filled up with liquid, and he ended up in Coquini in ICU. Um, he's now um, considered hospice, so he's not out of the woods yet, but you know, it's like Leo said, um, we serve a God that makes the impossible possible. Amen. In, in human man's eyes, he should be dead, mm -hmm. but God has better plans for him, and God is still able. He's, he's not out of the woods yet, so I ask you to continue to pray for him, you know, and I had another friend that um, passed away. I didn't get to go see him. And I, I had prayed to and asked the Lord, Lord, don't take him unless his salvation is secure in you. 
And I had perfect peace when I got the news that he had passed. So I'm pretty sure Nathan is in heaven with Jesus right now, you know, looking down on us. But, you know, it only brings me to this. We have friends and family that, oh, yeah, they know we go church and we specifically, oh, yeah, you know, you should, the Lord this, the Lord that. But we've never asked them the condition of their soul. And the Bible says, what should it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet lose his soul? That's how important our soul is, especially the souls of those we love that do not know Jesus as Savior. I want my family with me in heaven. I don't want them in hell. And the people in hell don't want them in hell either. You know, I mean, so much. I mean, really. But I I just thank God that my friend TK is still alive. I'm probably going to go see him sometime this week because... I have a doctor appointment on Tuesday, and I think, Becca, can you take me anyway? So, you know, <laughs> I, I can't just go by myself, you know what I mean? And bless Brother's heart, yesterday she had to hike me up the hill over here at Kala Hill, I mean, at Ka- Ka- Castle, and everybody, I told Brother, everybody looking at you, oh, that poor teen, that girl. <laughs> but, but we made it, and she's okay, you know, she's still alive. <laughs> she got her exercise for the year, but yeah, so praise God, he is still on the, on the throne, and he is still in the miracle working business, and he's still in the saving business. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, there you go. You got to come to the front. Yeah. Good morning. Praise the Lord. It's like this guy, every time he got to ring the bell. But, <laughs> but you, know, you know what? Um, real quick, my daughter wasn't supposed to uh, walk but, um, because she was tardy. And uh, they told her to go home, so she called me up at work, and I cannot leave at work. And uh, I, I, I was really upset, you know. Coffee for you. I said some harsh stuff to her, you know, the planning, you know. Long story short, my wife couldn't respond, but she texted and she said, just leave it up to God. We're just going to pray. And you know what? We prayed, and I felt at peace, but yet I was really mad she couldn't walk. But you know what? When I went home... The principal called and said that she was waiting outside, but he had a meeting. And when he came out, she left. She caught the bus home, and, she, and Malachi saw her at the bus stop crying. But she got home. I got home, and then I got a phone call at about 3, little after 3. The principal explained that, that she can walk. <laughs> it, it, was an, uh, it was an accident. There's a video that shows that she was on time. So... That's all God, you know. That's all God. Amen. <laughs> so, praise the Lord. Yeah. Bye-bye. Your coffee over there. <laughs> any, any more bells? Um, is it on? The, the oh, here we go. Okay. Thank you. A couple of announcements. Um, July 13, we're having our To Hawaii conference. It's titled Aloha on Purpose. And uh, before I to cast vision, uh, I think the big thing that God put on my heart to share is that this conference is free. Every single part of it is free. Um, normally, we have to pay to cover costs, but we felt like as leaders, we wanted to Reach out to those who are not active uh, in attending church or not even active in their faith. And that's really our target audience. So it's equipping the saints to invite our friends and our families who don't know the Lord or might need an extra boost of help in following the Lord in faithfulness, obedience, to come to this three-day conference for free. Um, So child care is free, but if you're going to... Uh, bring your children for child care during the conference. I want to encourage you to go online right now and register your kids because space is limited. There's only 60 seats available uh, for child care. So if, if you go to register your child and the space is booked, then you have to watch your, the kids got to sit with you during the conference. So July 13th. Also that week, it's really uh, it's Aloha week because we're actually having... Danny Silk, it's a Volso. We're going to have workshops for the business community, uh, exercising uh, the values of the kingdom of God in business, um, and then in family, in the church, and beyond. So I'll put that on the app, so make sure you get on the app so you, you can see and access the communication and all this information. Um, 
the second thing I forget what I was going oh the slades yeah thank you guys for being here uh, such a blessing for for many of you guys don't know it's the the slades the Lunga Lua's we all grew up together and in many ways they denied me in so many ways um, in during the week of Father's Day week um, I see that's when Mika them and Tahina Las Vegas will be in town. So Tahine Las Vegas is an extension of our ministry. Um, so Mika and the team, they'll be here. They'll be participating in tournaments. I believe uh, Asi and some of the uh, Tahine coaches will uh, find ways where we, the church, can feed and fellowship with the families from Las Vegas um, in how we can minister and fellowship and, and support them and really support Mika and Heather as they do the ministry in Las Vegas. So it's exciting time for us. And I want you to know, Tina and Larry, it's, it's because you guys have housed me whenever I go to Vegas. So Tahine Las Vegas is, is really birth out of you guys' house. Uh, because every time I would stay, because Larry houses me, and um, I would stay from his house and I would drive from his house to the gym, support EJ. And throughout that whole time, passing through the strip and through the freeway, uh, the Lord was saying, how come nobody's blessing my city? And I was like, because it doesn't deserve to be blessed. And he goes, well, that's how you feel, but I love Las Vegas. And this will be going back and forth, like for the whole week. And I'm there for two weeks, and the Lord is convicting me. He says, are you willing to love Las Vegas the way I love Las Vegas? And each time, my heart started to transform, started to shift. It started to look at Las Vegas the way God looks at Las Vegas. And by the end of the two weeks, I said, Lord, I truly love Las Vegas. And I understand why now, Lord, why we're here. And then it's from that that Las Vegas was birthed. Tahine Las Vegas was birthed. So that's the roots, the roots of Las Vegas. Tahine Las Vegas was me having an encounter with the Lord and saying, Lord, we're willing to adopt this city. I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know all the details. And because as soon as that trip, uh, Asi, Grant, you guys went up, and they started to do some prophetic acts. They started to do some declarations. And then all of a sudden, here we are. And, and so during that week, while they're here, we're going to have... Um, Mika and Heather share just some testimonies, how God is using them, how God is working in them. So everything that what Leo shared, what Paula shared, it is true that God is using our little old church to have a big impact. I'd rather have a big impact than a large crowd. Uh, to me, it's who's in the crowd, what kind of difference, what kind of people that's in the crowd that are actually going to advance heaven on earth, that it will take the light of God and, and be light in this world to set captives free, to set prisoners free, to set those in bondage free, because that's what Jesus did. Uh, today we're talking about time to leave the nursery. If we could go back about two or three weeks ago, um, I said that we're going to do this long series, 10 to 12 weeks, about discipleship. And this is something that God has calling and birthing it within my heart that it's about creating a culture where everybody is a disciple and everyone is making disciple and everyone is multiplying disciples. And we started with the message about from the home to the nations, that discipleship needs to begin in the home, that before we disciple we have to do all three at the same time, discipling our marketplace, discipling the people in our ministry, but starting for, foremost in our home, discipling our home, not just our kids, but allowing the Lord to disciple our marriages. That this picture of this baton, that each and every one of us has a baton in our hands that we have inherited from our parents, the values, the teachings, Things that it was near and dear to our parents. Whether it was given to you directly or indirectly, you have a baton. But the second question is, is that baton, are you willing to pass it down to your kids? Because there are some things given to us by our parents, again, whether directly or indirectly, that we don't want to pass down. 
And we love our parents. We want to honor our parents, our grandparents, our ancestors, the matriarchs and the patriarchs of our family. We always want to honor them. Never do we want to curse them or condemn them or shame them. Never. Recognizing that they're imperfect, that they've made mistakes. But we got to look back and say, let's look what God did in our families. And what was passed down, what was perpetuated that somehow I have in my life, both the good and the bad, the bad we got to release, that we got to let go. Whether it be adultery, whether it be abuse, violence, negativity, divorce. Okay, not all divorce is bad now. But if you see in some families Every single family member that's alive has been divorced. Or maybe better yet, a, 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 a difficult, frustrated, a broken marriage. Look back in your family's life right now. What has been the systemic poverty that's been patterned in your family? Not to judge the family, but just to, in order for us to move from A to B, you got to know where you are. You got to know where you are before you can get to where you want to be. And the Lord is saying, well, not just your family, but whether it's a former pastor or present pastor or a spiritual father or mother in your life, taught you the gospel, gave to you, entrusted in you the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the question is, are we raising our kids to run with the baton? Are they, are they sticking their hand back wanting to receive the baton? Do they want to run with Jesus? And we got to help them with that. Because a lot of times they, they may not want to run with the, with the baton of the gospel. It's not because of the gospel but because of the way we actually delivering it to them. What we pass down and how we pass down, I should say how we pass down the gospel, is equally important to the what, to the message of the gospel. So we have to get them to that second phase of them wanting to receive it, them running with it, and then the third phase is are they trained to pass it to the next generation? Do they have the heart and the mind and the skills, the know-how to passing it out to your grandchildren? And so we got to have this vision of 500 years from now in your family line, where will they be with Christ? What's the status, the health of the family? Will, will it be better because of what you're doing today as a family in relationship with the Lord? Or will it be worse because of what we are not doing with Jesus Christ? I remember my first month in ministry. This is 20 years ago when I was a youth pastor. Had this 40-year veteran. And he said this to me. He says, Ellie... I'm going to measure your ministry, not next year, but 20 years from now. Where your youth are, that will tell me what kind of leader you are as a youth pastor. No different as a senior pastor, no different as a parent. How we raise our kids, how we love our kids, how we discipline our kids, how we bring correction to our kids, how we nurture our kids, affects them for life. And how we do this sets the tone for the third and fourth generation, and so on and so on. Um, I hope you guys understand that this is good news I'm, I'm actually sharing. Because you guys look at me like, uh, we headed south, Ellie. <laughs> guys, I ain't talking about the church. I'm talking about your family. What's more important than your family? On this side of heaven, nothing. 
Nothing. Nothing. God had this awesome dream for Abraham. Every family of every nation will be blessed by you. You know what Abraham said? Oh, that's nice, but I don't want a kid. No matter how terrific your vision is, Lord, I need a child, you know, for that vision to come to pass. I need a family. The roots of Scripture is family. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, the roots is family. When Jesus returned for his bride, it's family. Abraham is the father of our faith. That's family. Everything we do in this blessings that we just practice, we're not just doing this for sure now. The reason why we instituted this, because the Lord is teaching us how to do church in the family and how to be family in the church. Do you know that the 12 tribes that Jacob blessed his children? When, when Moses was done with the tabernacle and he inspected the work that he instructed the workers to build, he said, okay, everything up to par, all codes, all policies, procedures, thumbs up. You guys have built what the Lord has showed me on the mountain. Come here, all workers, lay hands, let me bless you guys. See, blessings cannot be taken lightly. We got to understand as parents, when we bless our children, that stuff is real. The blessings go to work if you understand the significance of a father's and mother's blessing. So that was just one week one. Last week we talked about the crowd. See, in order for actually receive this call and get inspired, not just inspired, it's not because it, inspired, the, the civil war is off. It actually has to happen internally, deep down in our bosom, that we want to be transformed. That if we're going to take these challenges on in cleansing, purifying, and changing the culture of our families. Um, it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take the hand and the move and the power of God, the miracles of God, to move in and through our lives. And how does that happen? It means that you die to your ways. It means that you take everything that you have learned and all that you hold value, even the good stuff, and you lay it out the altar and you empty yourself up and you say, Lord, whatever you want to do, I'm going to do it your way. And the title was, you got to leave the crowd. Because being in the crowd, even though Jesus ministered to the crowd, he never lived in a crowd. He never did once live to the crowd by allowing the crowd to dictate his vision. He never allowed the influence, the power of the crowd and the culture, the mass public to make decisions for him. Jesus was saying, crowd, I ain't afraid to lose you for me to fulfill the work of my father. See, oftentimes we, whether it's, and a lot of times it's the church too, that we can operate this consumer mentality about church. I don't like that church because I don't like the music. A pastor's message is too long or too short. I, don't, I cannot really connect with the people. It's not my demographics. See, w w when we start to say those things about the church, that means that we're shopping for a church that conveniences us, that makes it comfortable for us. You'll never find that in Jesus. He actually went cross culture he went counter culture because the kingdom of god is upside down what this world values jesus says that's actually rubbish what we think will last forever the lord says that will per perish in a second in heaven 
he never did placate to the crowd. He never did try to be winsome to try and win the crowd. He was always about changing the crowd. So God is sending us into the crowd, not to condemn the crowd, not to shame the crowd, not to persecute the crowd, but to love the crowd and win the crowd for Jesus Christ. And that's what God is calling us to do. And that was last week. Today, we're going to kick off about five levels of discipleship. There's five levels and stages of growing in Christ. Just as in a physical way. We start off as infants, then we become young adults, we become teenagers, young adults, adults, and then we move on to our golden years as grandparents. No different in a spiritual life. No difference in the spiritual realm. And I would argue the spiritual realm more important than the physical. It's much more important. So we're going to begin from the nursery that we've all been here. And I, I want us to understand that as we go through this process and these stages, it's never intended to shame. But I'm not afraid to offend you. Meaning, if the truth is offending you, I will not apologize that for that. So the goal is not to offend you. The goal is to share the truth. Okay? Does that make sense? For three people. <laughs> you, you, you do know that the gospel is offensive by nature, right? Because the gospel starts off. The, see, before there's a good news, which is what the gospel is called, before you can have good news, you need what? You need bad news. Before you can rise from the dead, you need what? You need to die. Okay? So, just giving perspective. Again, my goal is to share the truth, and the result of the fruit of truth is what? Freedom. Okay? <laughs> freedom. How many want freedom? I want freedom. Right? Yeah, Taylor, with two hands. Yes. I go three. I want freedom. <laughs> Absolutely. But we need the truth. And yes, the truth can hurt. That, that's, that's part of the truth. It, 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 it tells you where you are. It holds us accountable. You could say that you're loving, but the truth will come back. Says, Not necessarily. You love yourself, but you don't love other people. So it's always meant to bring freedom. So we're going to go through these stages. Uh, I'll just give a brief overview, but today's word is about leaving the nursery. And we've all been in this stage before. And honestly, to be, to be more um, complete is that you get to stage five, then God promotes you to another level. Then when you're at that level, you know what happens? You become an infant again. So everybody is going through cycles. Every time God promotes me, I got to be a spiritual infant again. But the key for all of us, no matter where we are, is we got to get to level five. We got to intentionally get to level five. And let me say that again. You got to choose to be in level five. Let me say that again. Nobody can choose for you to grow. Let me say this again. You have to determine to grow. Let me say this again. You got to commit to growth. Let me say this again. Nobody can choose for you to grow. Let me say this again. God, you cannot trust God to make decisions for you to grow. He's giving you the freedom and the power to choose. So this is one of the key points. You have to choose to grow. You have to want to grow. You have to be dedicated to growth. You have to be committed to growth. I get into sour faces, guys. <laughs> you know these words. They're synonymous with champions. 
If, if we don't actually like and fall in love with these words, you know what we end up being? Not champions, not losers, haters. Talk stink about people who are actually falling, progressing, and, fall, and, and they're falling forward, and they're going up. And all we do is sitting back, hating, 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 hating. Why? Because we're not willing to do what they're doing. What does that sound like? It sounds like a baby. So what is discipleship? It's learning, to f- learning how to follow Jesus Christ through faithful obedience to his commands. It has more to do with what you're doing than what you know. It's true wisdom comes from doing. You want wisdom? Do. If you want wisdom, you have to do his commands. And it takes time. See, that's why it's easy to be in a crowd. Because there's no accountability. You can come and it's just swinging doors. You can come and go as you please. Or oh, this person of family, I'm going to dig out. Yeah, that's the crowd. You know, in a culture of heaven, discipleship, if somebody offends you, you go to that person, you make it right. In a loving way. In a loving way. I have found I confront and fight more in the kingdom than when I wasn't in the kingdom. Before Christ, I never got into any, yeah, we got into a lot of physical fights, but not the verbal kind. You know why? Because I didn't know how to do the verbal. I was afraid to share my true feelings, and I did not have any skill to listen to what the other person is saying. So what did I do? I, re- I isolate myself. I go in one cave. I was a recluse, a hermit crab, because I was afraid and I was unskilled on how to communicate. But now in the kingdom of God, I've learned he liked to talk. He says, hey, you got an issue with so-and-so. And this takes maturity. But if I offend somebody, both sides got to be at the table. I can only handle my end of the relationship. I cannot handle your end. But that's going down. But it's learning. And the key word for learning, you got to think apprenticeship. No, think learning, academia learning. There's a place for writing things down, memorizing, studying. Absol- that's part of learning. But the true learning in discipleship in the scriptures is both classroom time and OJT, on-the-job training. Isn't it funny that you get people in college and even in, in seminaries, they leading classes for business, and yet they've never owned a business. But they're teaching the knowledge of how business works. Or same for seminaries. You get scholars, theologians, but they've never led a church. They never pastored a church. And somehow we think as Christians, oh, I know the definition of disciples, but yet you're not being discipled. And you're not discipling others. See, that's what learning is. You get classroom time, but you get OJT time. On-the-job training on how to live it out, how to practice it. Because everything that you learn will be tested. And you need spiritual fathers and mothers by your side and saying, good job, way to go, but also to have smelling salt to whiff, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Oh, you didn't see that one coming, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. we put some holy water on you, pray for you. In the name of Jesus, rise from the dead, get back up. Laugh, and that's cool. I'm, I'm cool with that because that's the reality. That's the reality. A young, uh, we had an intern, and I was pastoring now for uh, seven years. I love our church, okay? I want to make that clear. When I was at Middle Island Missionary Church. 
So he's entered. He said, you want to be a youth pastor? He says, hey, Eli, can I, you, you think I have what it takes to be a youth pastor? And this is what I said to him. I said, let me punch you in your face, spit on your face, stab you in the heart, stab you in the back, slap you across your head. If you're still willing to serve Jesus by the people that you serve, then you can be a youth pastor. He goes, what? He goes, oh, I don't know if I could do that. I said, okay, we're clear. <laughs> we're clear. And he was young. Before the people complain, right? When they was leaving Egypt to go to promised land, who was the number one complainer? Moses. Moses. So ministry is tough. That's why you need training. That's why we all need training. This is what this is the learning part of saying your wife is not actually or your husband is not the enemy. That's not the devil. Yeah, sometimes they can act like the devil. But that's not the devil. I would complain. I said this to you guys before. I would complain to the Lord about you guys. And the Lord said this. Well, the sheep just following the shepherd. Uh, uh. You, know, you, you know when you lose an argument, you try to find another case, try to build up this argument, and you just feel like the thing just unraveling. And you just get, okay, Lord, you're right. See, when you're learning OJT, it sounds weird, but you got to learn how to love people. God's way, not your way. God's way. And it is offensive on you to love people his way. You heard what Millie said, right, in her testimony. Me and my friends, we came to bus company company together then he went to the dark side became management <laughs> how many of us can relate to that and yet we are still called to love so it's all part of discipleship so there's five levels the first is this there's spiritual infants first corinthians chapter three and this is what we're going to talk about but i just want you to quickly note that the first level and stage of growing Christ, we begin as spiritual babes in Christ, infants in Christ. The second is become, we become spiritual children. Galatians 4.19, oh my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your life. So it's almost like your know, tween years. Those of us who have kids, they're innocent as doves until they start going, you know, six, seven, eight grade. They're like, uh, who are you? You, you change. You're different. This, you're taking on a different personality. Some of the actions, the words you're using, you never used to use these words before. But that's part of growing up. That's part of growing up. Same with our faith in Christ, our walk with, with Christ, our journey in Christ. The second is to become spiritual young adults. The third, I should say. In 1 John 2, 14, I've written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I've written to you who are mature in faith because you know Christ who, who existed from the beginning. But the third is there's a maturation process. Uh, I should say a commitment towards maturing Christ, wanting to uh, grow in Christ. So there, there has been some buy-in and consistent decisions and actions of a person saying, I'm willing to practice the disciplines of growing in Christ. Uh, a lot of people think being filled with the Holy Spirit is spontaneous. And I would argue against that. It takes discipline to be filled and to walk in the Spirit. So these are people who have consistently, and they're growing in prayer. They're growing in the Word. They're, they're doing what it takes to foster this intimate relationship with God. If you're a leader, you understand this. Leadership is a lonely road. In other words, God will pull you from your family, 
God will pull you from the crowd. God will call you. He will select you. He will invite you. He will put his glory and his presence upon you. There will be a pressing on your life. And you'll have an awakening that where I'm at right now, is, I'm not cursing where I'm at, but this doesn't seem like it's nourishing to me. i got to go to a mountain. i got to go to a solitude. i got to go to some place where I can, so I can meet with God without distractions. That's the beginning stage of, of being a spiritual young adult. They're, they're leaving the nest. They're leaving the home. And they're willing to be like Abraham, to leave the house, to leave the father in this household and go to an unknown place. This is what it takes. This is what it means to be a disciple of one wanting to grow, being willing to develop disciplines, habits, practices. Paul says, I train my body like an athlete, like a box. I don't just shadow box. I don't just punch air. I'm timing my punches. I'm working on my punches because why? Because I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in one battle. And when I'm in a battle, I'll like win. There's none of these great Hall of Fame boxers who jump in the ring and just six months of just watching TV, drinking soda, and eating chips. No professional athlete would do that. And guess what? You know the fight we're in is greater than any boxing match in history. What a lot of people don't know, whether it's in this church or other churches, you facing the enemy every single day. Do you know how to bob and weave? Do you know how to throw a right cross? Do you know how to put up a shield of faith? Do you know how to take out the sword and the word of God and slay giants? That takes training, people. Then it's the fourth level, being a spiritual parent. 1 Corinthians 4.15, for even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father, for I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. A father and mother is the same thing. And what they do is that they establish the culture of heaven in the home. That's what Becca and I are doing. And we're saying, we're teaching our kids. We are Polynesians of our cultures. But what's going to take precedence is the culture of heaven. And all of us should be proud of our cultures. But be careful to never allow the traditions of men make void the power of the word. That's what Jesus said. He says, your traditions has voided the power of the word of God because of your traditions. So what Beck and I are doing with our kids, and we're doing it in the church as well, that yes, there are some things that have been passed down that they come into alignment. There's a hand and glove. They fit with our culture from our upbringing, from our parents, from our ethnicities, that they align, they Bluetooth, they mirror the culture of heaven. Keep those. If it doesn't work, doesn't fit, you got to get rid of them. Why? Do you know that when God gave Moses the blueprints, God put his spirit upon Bezalel and Oholiab to make the tabernacle? Then God instructed Moses, go make sure the tabernacle up to par. It was up to par. He blessed it. Only then did, the Holy, did God himself house the tabernacle. God saying, I gave you guys work to do. Okay, you guys doing no work. I'm not going to allow my glory. I'm not going to share my glory in that tent unless that tent looked like heaven. So if you're wondering, how come not, not, not enough light in my home, in our church, or ministry, in our marketplace? Simple as this. It doesn't look like the house of God. The language is different. The actions are different. There's no forgiveness. There's no confession. There's no love. There's no truth. 
So God is saying, I love you. My love will never stop. But my glory, my power, my blessing cannot land in that place because it does not match up to my surroundings. I don't feel like I'm at home. But that's the work of spiritual parents is that we change culture. Not to colonize, to, to suppress and oppress people, but to free people. And the reality is our kids and our families, they need to learn how to talk. We need to learn how to listen. We need how to learn to love. We need to learn how, you know what? We need to learn how to lead. And our kids need to learn how to follow. And that takes a lot of work. So I hope you guys seeing that discipleship is no easy task. The how-tos are simple. But you need the power of the Lord <laughs> to move for anything to get done. The last is spiritual grandparent. <sighs> and by the way, you don't need to be an age of a grandparent. I have several. I, I, Becca and I have some spiritual grandkids. And you don't need to have a physical child to be a spiritual parent. The epitome of spiritual fathering in biblical text in the New Testament is who? The Apostle Paul. How many kids did he have? Zero. Zero physical kids. And yet God would use him penning how to be a spiritual father. Abraham, the father of our faith, God used and made a covenant with who? Ishmael or Isaac? Isaac. Because who's Isaac from? It's from God. It's not from Abraham. So what's the point? The point is spiritual children. Spiritual parenting. Our physical, flesh and blood children is a gift. They're blessings of the Lord. But don't think just because you have no spiritual, I mean physical, that God cannot use you. You're wrong. I would venture to say God can use you even more just by those two examples. Second Timothy two, chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. But let's go. Just, okay, we're going to real briefly. I know I'm going over time. If you guys got to leave, I bless you. You can go, okay? Because um, we, we're going over time. So we talked about this, 1 Corinthians 3, 1, 3. Dear brothers and sisters, this is the Apostle Paul. He's talking to his spiritual children. When I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. So I want to talk about... Uh, it's three, but it's really two marks of what a spiritual infant means, what it looks like, the behavior is a spiritual child, so that through the Holy Spirit, we can see, and if we got to admit this quietly before the Lord, am I a baby, Lord? And again, this is never meant to hurt, condemn, or shame, but to just know where you are or where we are and Move towards the goal of being a spiritual parent. It is process. It takes time. It's a journey. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Trust me. It took me a long time to run a marathon. I think I still run it. Okay? So it says this, I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to talk, I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food. The picture is this. Paul, the parent, is saying, I have wisdom from God that I want to impart upon you, but your mind is not willing and unable to carry the load that I'm about to give to you. There is some 
truths, some principles, and some revelations that God has given me. I want to give to you, but you cannot handle it. What Paul is saying is the message that I want to bring, I gave you message. I gave you food. There hasn't been much growth on your end. Therefore, the words and the message I want to give you is, is sophisticated. It's elevated. It's divine. It takes a lot of skill. And I see that you have none of these things. So I have to use plain, simple, elementary truths to you. You cannot handle what I'm about to give you. I want to give you this thing, but you just, it, it doesn't fit you. And so he says, I feed you. I had to feed you with milk and not with solid food. So this is what we look like as spiritual infants. You don't know how to feed yourself. Are you still in baby formula? So that means there's a lot of malnourishment. See, it's not necessarily Paul was trying to give them new revelation about a new topic. He was saying, I have deeper awareness of what I told you from years ago. Let's use prayer, for example, okay? Everybody still here? Some people are already praying, okay? <laughs> All right. A spiritual baby will say this about prayer. Prayer doesn't really matter. Prayer doesn't really work. I don't want time for prayer. Prayer is too difficult. I don't think prayer even matters that much. That's the language, that's the tone, that's the repetitive nature. I don't want time to pray of a spiritual infant. A spiritual grandparent will say, if I don't pray, I get demolished. In fact, I feel like I need to do more praying. Without prayer, nothing gets done. Amen. Without prayer, heaven doesn't move. Without prayer, I cannot cast out demons from my house. I can't even cast demons from my life. I don't even have a chance in my next fight if I don't have a prayer life, a strong prayer life. You see the difference? We're talking about the same thing, prayer. Danny, he's teaching his people how to pray. And he got people all over in Hawaii and beyond. One in particular is in California in his business. And he's been teaching his people how to pray in the marketplace. The people in Hawaii, they understand what, what, what Danny's teaching them about prayer. Probably giving Danny thumbs up, likes, great job, emojis, fist pump, prayer hands, fire. <laughs> I got you. The people in California, they're taking it a step further. They're not actually listening to Danny. They're doing what Danny telling them to do. So they're saying, Danny say pray. Uh, let's get together, two or three of us, and pray. How long have they been praying together, Danny? 60 days of prayer. Amen. So I said, oh, that's some time of uh, warring up there. And I know this. When people pray, no matter where they are, things start to move. Trust me, if you are a baby or a grandparent, it doesn't matter. The thing is, are you praying? So he said, well, one thing, one of the guys in that group hasn't broken through financially for six plus years. And all of a sudden, phew, skyrocketing. He said, the team over there that's actually working and they're praying, they're getting the most results with the least amount of effort. Come on, somebody. You know what non-prayer life is? I'm going to pray little. I'm going to work real hard. And all I get is this. A spiritual grandparent says, I ain't going to do nothing until the Lord tells me to move. And I'm just going to sit and I'm going to move in prayer. I'm going to increase my time in prayer. I'm going to deepen my prayer life. And all of a sudden, as you're praying, oh, cha-ching, cha-ching, oh, okay, God, you're moving. Thank you, Lord. I keep praying. 
God does the work for you in prayer. That's what Jesus said. Ask anything in my name, and I'm going to make sure that your prayer gets answered. Can I use you, Anthony? Anthony gave me a call one day. Now, Anthony's in, like, second in command with a major car dealership in Hawaii. And he said, Pastor, I need some advice. Uh, we could go to under. So it could hear the tone in his voice was fear and concern, rightfully so. And he said, what do you suggest? He's a businessman asking a non-businessman how to do business. And I said, okay, I want you to grab two or three of your people and pray every day. Pray for God to bless your business. And I asked him, <laughs> I think, what was it, Thursday or Friday? He says, you know what? We up and down. There are some days we're doing really good. Some days we struggle. You know what? That's a win. Because the last time we called, I said, uh, we could close up shop if things don't happen. See, grandpa, so a spiritual baby will say, that ah, prayer don't really matter. So they look like that. Get more food on the table, on the floor, all over their face than in their mouth. And they're saying, oh, I'm eating. I'm eating. I talk about the word. So spiritual babies, they cannot comprehend. They cannot understand the weight. Not just prayer, like heavens. People, you'll, you'll ask a spiritual baby about heaven. What does that mean to you? Oh, that's where God lives and that's where I will be when I die. Okay. A spiritual grandparent will say, well, which heavens are you talking about? Because a spiritual grandchild parent knows that there are different dimensions in this world. There's a first heaven, second heaven, third heaven, and then there's a fourth heaven. So which heaven are you really speaking about? Do you know that the unseen world is more real than the physical? When in Luke 10, when Jesus sent out his apostles to do prayer evangelism, they were doing miracle signs and wonders, and they came back to Jesus to, have, to give a report. And this is what Jesus said to the 12, or the 70 at that time. Uh, they came back and said, Lord, they, we cast out demons. Everybody bow down when, they, when we mention your name. He said, okay, that's cool, but let me tell you what I saw. I saw, as you guys were doing ministry, I saw Satan fall like lightning. What does that mean? It means as you guys were doing the work, you guys evicted the principality over that city. See, what we need to understand, if we want this to change, you got to change, and you got to change the spiritual atmosphere, the spiritual climate. That's what people don't understand. That's what Paul is saying. I said, <laughs> it's like, oh, man, I see heavyweight champion of the world in you. But you just want to fight at White Power Rec Center. In fact, you even like fight the illegal fight on the street. You just want to be ghetto fabulous. No, the, the world is waiting for you. Okay? So they don't understand. Even though it's the basic prayer in heavens, heavens and the earth, there's actually a lower earth too. And each level, there is protocol, there is authority, there is culture. And Jesus is saying, if you knew that my authority supersedes every single authority in each realm, you would rock this world. Make sense? Okay. If it doesn't, it's okay. The Lord will minister to you. The second thing is this. You're still controlled by your sinful nature. Look at this. At the bottom part, you still aren't ready for you're still controlled by your sinful nature. What Paul was saying is not only you understand you're incapable and competent of understanding greater truth, wisdom, sophistication of his word, you're still controlled for your sinful nature. Specifically what? You're constantly quarreling and fighting. That's a sign of a baby. Fighting with everybody. Quarreling with everybody. Very jealous. Other translations use the word division. There's division among you. You know what the, the word division means? 
you get two visions. You break out the word division. Dai means two, separate. Vision, when you have two separate visions in a house, you have a divided house. Therefore, constantly fighting, constantly struggling. Should we tithe? Yes. No, that's my money. Should we go to church? Yes, you can go, but I'm not going to go. Should we discipline our kids? Yeah, do the old school new way or the new way? Should we spend time in prayer? Yes, no. What is this? What am I talking about? I'm talking about one person in the family has one vision for the family. Another person in the family has another vision. Therefore, the friction. Therefore, the fighting. That's baby talk. The first three years of our marriage, I, don't know, I threw my, wing or my ring away because we were constantly fighting. She had a vision for my life before I had a vision for my own life. And I was a so broken, insecure leader that she, because her leadership anointing is so strong, I felt intimidated. So here I am trying to prove to her that I can lead. And here she is trying to put her anointing on me. So we constantly bickered and fight. Not about it. We, talk, we fought about God leading our family. And who's the leader? And who's following? That's three years. Praise God, yeah, three years, not 30 years. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll, take, I'll make that trade any time, any day. And included that is jealousy. One picture I remember, and the Lord brought it up, was during worship when EJ was born. We brought him to the house about six, seven months. I was like, it's, you know, as a parent of young kids, if it's quiet, what? Something is up. It was quiet in the house. So I'm looking for EJ, looking for Taylor. That, that, that Taylor wasn't here. Okay. This board is EJ. Okay. You guys see this lower level? This is Taylor. <laughs> Jumping on EJ. Okay. That's not to shame you, baby. EJ was probably one. Okay. Yes. What's the point? What do babies do when a new baby come in? They get jealous. She didn't know that. She's young. Everybody in here has experienced it, Taylor. Trust me. When a new baby comes in, other babies get jealous. Why? Because more attention is being given to that person. I'm not here to cater to your needs. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to lead you. But God brings other people, and it's just by his leading, I'm spending more time with that other person. It's not because I don't see God moving and working in you. It's that some of these people need more time and attention from me. A lot of these babies, both in the church and outside the church, they feel like, just because more attention is given to somebody else, that somehow God, the parents of the leaders, have forsaken and abandoned them. No. Only a child will think that way. See, a child needs to constantly grow. To learn from being fed, being changed, learning how to feed yourself, and learning how to change yourself. I was going to show a picture of this, but there wasn't any good pictures. There's, there's, I think there's, um, the Lord wants to stop changing your pampas. Spiritually. The Lord wants to stop changing our pampas. And we got to know how to cleanse and purify ourselves in the name of the Lord. Because this is the worst part. As he says this, 
Not only you don't understand what I'm saying, and not only you you still on spiritual milk, and not only that uh, you constantly fight and quarrel with one another. You guys have all kinds of visions. I don't even know what you guys are talking about. I never give you that. That's your vision. That's not God's vision. The worst part is this, and you're still not ready. This is the heartbeat of being a spiritual infant. You don't want to change. So that's the picture of a spiritual baby. The spiritual baby can be 80 years old, 60 years old, 40 years old, 12 years old. It doesn't matter. What's the posture of your heart? If you like this when the Lord telling you to do something or the Lord puts a leader in your life to tell you to do something and you like this or you like this, that is the hallmark of being a spiritual infant. Hallmark. Let's pray. Father, we've all been at this place of being a babe in Christ. Lord, I thank you for the patience that you've displayed, but also the commitment to bringing growth in and through our lives, our families, and our ministries, Lord. But I pray for each person, including myself, Lord, that we would desire today to no longer be an infant in Christ, to move towards each level of and growth and stage of maturity to becoming spiritual parents. And Lord, I thank you that it doesn't matter our backgrounds. It doesn't matter how great our sin has been. Our dis- no, that It's all been paid for already. It's all been done. All you look for is a heart that's willing to say yes and the actions to, to follow through to what the heart and mind is saying. So, Lord, I ask that you bless each person here, each family here. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. You guys be blessed.